Good morning. My name is Laura Nelson. I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate Education for the Faculty of Science. And on behalf of the Dean and our entire faculty, I would like to welcome you to day four of the 33rd edition of Soup and Science. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that McGill University is on land which long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous people, including the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous people whose footsteps have marked this territory on which the world now gather. Today we're joined by four fantastic uh, speakers who will tell us about their research. Uh, first, we'll have Professor Natasha Chang from the Department of Biochemistry, uh, then uh, Professor Anna Hargreaves from the Department of Biology, Professor Caitlin Schultz, uh, Schutz from the Department of Physics, and Joe uh, Sanchez Schacht, who's a student in the Department of Biology. So really highlighting uh, students as such an important component of our uh, research enterprise in the faculty. Uh, following the presentations, the, so before we start the presentations, I want to let you know that afterwards, uh, students, all of you in attendance, will have the opportunity to answer what we in Canada call a skill testing question about each presentation. So this will be a, a question asking you about something you heard in the speaker's mm -hmm. talk. The top uh, 10 students who answer the questions correctly in the fastest time will win a prize. And this prize will be a $25 gift card to the Le James bookstore. Um, so after this, uh, a moderated question and answer session, which will occur in breakout rooms. So we'll have one speaker and one moderator in each breakout room. You'll be able to choose which room you wanna visit and uh, join the breakout room on your own. This should be apparent to you on your screens. I think we're all getting used to doing that by now. Uh, a few minutes before noon, we'll return to the main session for some final remarks and closing. Before we begin the presentations, however, I would like to welcome um, Principal Suzanne Fortier to the session, and I invite her now to share a few remarks. Bonjour, thank you, Professor Nelson. Bonjour à vous tous, bienvenue. Uh, and uh, I want to extend uh, my warmest welcome for the beginning of the year, the calendar year and the beginning of a new term. Of course, we all wish uh, that we could start this term and this new year in person. Uh, I'm hoping that this will be possible very soon, but for the moment, here we are again in the virtual world, but a world that allows us to interact with many, many uh, great uh, professors and students here at McGill and learn about what they do. I, as many of you know, this is a uh, series in the Faculty of Science that has uh, been taking place for 17 years. And I've been, uh, at least for the last nine years, a very frequent uh, participant. I don't think I've missed any uh, part of the soup and science uh, offering in the, uh, since I've been returning to my alma mater. It's fantastic series. And as I mentioned, introducing us to really uh, exciting area of research and, and coming out of that, realizing how much there is still to learn and how exciting it is to be part of research. One of the things that always impressed me at McGill, and it started from when I was a student, it was also the case when I was uh, in the uh, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, and of course, now that I'm back, is that at McGill, research is an activity that is um, offered for participation to all of our community. What I mean by that is, of course, we expect our professors to participate in research and our graduate students, but also our undergraduate students. There are incredible opportunities during undergraduate studies to be part of research activities. And of course, this is the best place for developing a passion for research. I will say this, and I think you know it from what we've been through in the last several years, Sometimes we have the false illusion that we know a lot and we know it all. Well, we don't. We know that. I think the pandemic has brought us a bit of a sense of humility. Although we made so much advances in knowledge, we still have a lot to learn. But in addition to that sense of humility is this great excitement about how much we need to learn, how much there is to learn, and now each of us can participate in advancing knowledge 
for all of the world. So this is a great event. I want to thank all the people who are participating, organizing it, and of course, our four speakers. And I look forward to seeing some of you in my chat, my uh, breakout room. But until then, please enjoy the event. Merci beaucoup. Uh, merci, Principal Fortier, uh, for those inspiring words. Um, I share your enthusiasm about the research, and I hope that the students will, will see this enthusiasm coming through in these short and accessible talks by our researchers. It's always really a great event. And I also share our wish that for the next session of Soup and Science um, coming up in the fall, that we'll actually be able to provide you with some soup. Uh, with that, I will introduce our first Natasha Chang from the Department of Biochemistry. Go ahead, Natasha. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Natasha Chang, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry. And so um, interesting fact is that 20 years ago, I was sitting on your side of the computer screen. And mm -hmm. so I was an undergraduate student in the Faculty of Science at McGill. And I just wanted to highlight uh, uh, that I agree completely with what uh, Principal Fortier said that McGill has a lot of great research opportunities for undergraduate students to get um, involved in research. And so I really encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities and get some, um, uh, get a taste of what it's like to um, do research in a lab. And so what does my lab study? Uh, we study the biology of muscle stem cells. So these are adult uh, stem cells that reside in the muscle tissue. And they are also called satellite cells. So that's this cell that's pictured here. And um, what uh, these cells are responsible for the remarkable regenerative capacity of skeletal muscle tissue. And what I find really fascinating about this uh, cell population is that it really represents a rare population within the muscle tissue. So really just around 5% of the total myonuclei. And yet they are responsible for launching an efficient muscle regeneration uh, response to uh, uh, injury to the myofiber. And so these cells are, are normally quiescent in resting muscle, um, but they become activated in response to stresses that are triggered by exercise, injury, or even muscle diseases. And then they enter the cell cycle and they uh, undergo rapid proliferation to generate these myogenic progenitors that then undergo differentiation and eventually fusion into these myotube structures. And that, that's what repairs the uh, damaged muscle tissue. And what I wanted to um, highlight here, oops, I don't think I can get this to play. There we go. Um, what I wanted to highlight is that these cells are really uh, dynamic in nature. So this is a, an example of a myofiber that's isolated from the hind limb muscle of a mouse and dancing on top of this myofiber is a satellite cell. Um, and, and you'll see here, it just underwent a division. Um, and, and, and so these are really dynamic structures um, uh, upon activation and, and now it's just undergone a second uh, round of division. And so one of the ways my lab studies muscle stem cells is by using immunofluorescence to visualize these cells. Um, and by culturing them on their myofiber, we can visualize their progression through myogenesis from quiescence to activation and, and uh, proliferation. And I'll just end by saying that uh, one of the main focuses of my lab is to really understand how muscle stem cell dysfunction contributes to muscle diseases. And what I wanted to uh, point out is that um, so muscle cancer, which is also known as rhabdomyosarcoma and muscle degeneration. And one of uh, uh, a main focus of my lab is, is this uh, lethal genetic disorder called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so while these diseases are vastly different, they actually share a common stem cell problem. And that is that the muscle stem cells in these myopathies have an impaired ability to differentiate. And so they remain stem cells um, and, and actually the muscles exhibit stem cell hyperplasia. Uh, but these stem cells cannot undergo uh, myog myogenic differentiation. And so one of the main uh, focuses of my lab is to identify strategies that can then promote uh, stem cell differentiation and restore stem cell function as a treatment strategy for these diseases. 
And so I'll end here and say that if you're interested in, in knowing more about what we do, you can visit our lab website and you can also email me uh, if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Natasha, for that um, very interesting and um, in, uh, um, uh, visually uh, appealing talk. Mm -hmm. um, we'll now move on to Anna Hargreaves, a professor in the Department of Biology. Go ahead, Anna. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Laura said, my name is Professor Anna Hargreaves, and I work in one of the departments at the McGill that studies life but does not focus on humans. And so um, humans are super fascinating and we love to think about ourselves, but we're just one of millions, um, if not billions of species on the planet. And many of these other species have um, social structures and evolutionary adaptations, lifespans, um, just as complex as humans. And you know, many can do things that humans could never dream of. So we're interested in this non-human world. And um, uh, the map that you see here, shows you the distribution of vertebrate species. So these are species like um, mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. And the hot, the warm colors on the map shows you um, places in the Americas with high, high concentrations of vertebrate species, high biodiversity. Um, and the map is showing you vertebrate species, not because vertebrates are um, a, the most important biological group, but because they're the only group for which we have good enough data to make this kind of map. Mm -hmm. And in fact, vertebrates are actually just a tiny, tiny fraction of the world's biodiversity. And so this really illustrates just how much we have to learn about the non-human species that we share the planet with. So my lab, um, we're primarily interested in two sets of questions about the world's biodiversity. First of all, um, we think a lot about species distributions. So each species occupies a specific corner of the world and, um, and we're interested in the factors that constrain it to that area. So why does that species occur where it does and not somewhere else? And this question is really interesting, partly because distributions of species overlap on each other to form the patterns of biodiversity that, um, that define the ecosystems that we know and love, but also because species distributions are really a core part of some um, important in, um, conservation problems that we're wrestling with. So, for example, uh, invasive species um, are undergoing explosive range expansions. Species at risk of extinction are often undergoing range contractions and um, millions of species around the world are predicted to shift their range uh, in response to climate change. Uh, and when biologists um, try and model the factors that constrain a species distribution or that might determine um, how it responds to, um, to disturbance, there's a long history of focusing on climate. Um, and we know climate is super important in determining species ranges, but we also know that species don't just exist all by themselves in a specific climate. They are, of course, embedded in these complex web of interactions with other species. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. So from the snake's perspective, this is a positive interaction. And from the hummingbird's perspective, it's probably not. Um, and these interactions between species are incredibly complex, um, super fascinating and compelling, and, um, and they can shape species distributions, they shape their evolution, and they shape the structure of ecological communities. So we think about species distributions and species interactions, and we use uh, three main approaches um, to look at them. So uh, first, our lab is really built on in-depth field experiments. So um, this is where we go out into the natural world and we do experiments that test um, theory and hypotheses about how um, the world works. And because it's an experiment, it's, um, it's really powerful, but they're also really super labor intensive. I mean, they're beautiful, field work's amazing, but you get the answer sort of one species at a time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we pair this approach with um, global data syntheses where we go to the published literature and we gather all the data in the world 
that relates to a question we're interested in. And this approach allows us to look for patterns beyond species and across ecosystems. And so this approach is really great um, in, its, in its reach, but often you're constrained to using data that weren't collected for the question you have in mind. And so we, uh, we also use a third approach that combines the strengths of these first two approaches, um, which is called a distributed experiment. And so that is when a group or network of researchers get together and they each do the same experiment using the same protocols in um, a ton of different places. So these stars that you see on this map, um, well, there's one star for Montreal, you can tell which one that is. And the others are places where um, a network that I run uh, has done um, experiments testing the, the strength and importance of interactions between species. And so this lets us combine the power of experiments with the global reach of, um, of data syntheses. And it's a really, you know, this tool is only possible um, in the last couple of decades with the advent of um, the internet and email mm -hmm. and file sharing. Um, and it is really shedding light on some um, uh, really interesting large scale latitudinal and elevational patterns in biodiversity. So that's what we do. Um, I, our research involves undergraduates um, at all possible stages. And so um, if you're interested in the natural world, um, yeah, get in touch. Uh, and I hope that whatever you do, you have lots of chances in your McGill career to explore um, non-human species. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that um, fascinating talk. I find it so interesting, the contrast. We, in the first talk, we saw a video of a single cell. And in the talk we just heard, we talked about the whole world. So very different scales. And I believe that our next speaker, Caitlin Schutz from the Department of Physics, will take us even to the next level or another level. Right. That's right. We're going to talk about the whole universe. So uh, let me share my screen. And I do this in kind of a funky way. So, all right, you guys can see my screen. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. So thanks so much for the organizers of, of Soup and Science for putting this uh, nice series of accessible talks together. Um, as was alluded to, I'm going to talk about using our entire universe as a giant particle physics experiment. Um, so I'm a, a new assistant professor, just got to McGill in September. Um, and I'm a theoretical physicist, and I think a lot about the uh, fundamental nature of the building blocks that make up our universe. And one particular focus of my research group is actually dark matter. Now, when people hear about uh, dark matter or related concepts, um, this might be what kind of comes into your mind. You might think about um, maybe the dark side of the force. Um, maybe this sounds like science fiction, like this is very exotic, uh, you know, sounding stuff. But I want to uh, disabuse you of the notion. So in my group, we're not uh, dealing with science fiction here, although that would be uh, fun. But instead, um, even though I'm a theoretical physicist, um, my, my work is all about confronting uh, theoretical ideas for what our universe could be doing and confronting those ideas uh, with data. And here are just a few examples. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into all of these, but uh, different pieces of observational data from astrophysics and cosmology uh, which my group has used in recent years uh, to confront questions of what our universe is made of. So um, we have a huge amount of evidence for the existence of dark matter. I don't have time to go into it all today because um, there's just so much overwhelming evidence. Um, and uh, the evidence comes from a, a diverse range of different kinds of systems, which is how we can actually be so confident that dark matter exists. Um, we have evidence across nine orders of magnitude uh, in length. Um, ranging all the way from uh, over here is a little thumbnail of uh, the tiniest uh, so-called dwarf galaxies. Uh, these are systems that are 99% dark matter by mass. Uh, and we can tell that using uh, gravitational inferences about how things are moving around in these galaxies. Um, we can also see evidence for dark matter on the largest scales in the universe. Looking uh, on the scale of the entire observable universe, we see tiny fluctuations, which have to be uh, seeded by dark matter gravity sort of clustering and, and bringing things together and amplifying perturbations because uh, gravity is an attractive force. So this gives us a huge lever arm, so nine orders of magnitude in length, also 17 orders of magnitude in time. Uh, along the entire timeline of the history of our universe, uh, we see dark matter uh, playing a role in different stages of how our universe evolves. 
Okay, so given all of that, uh, there's a pretty short list of things that we know about dark matter. We know how much of it there is by mass. We know it's actually around five times more abundant than regular matter. So matter that, you know, we're familiar with uh, atoms that makes up um, planets and stars and ice cream and, and cells and everything we heard about. So dark matter is around five times more abundant by mass. Uh, we know it's cosmologically stable, so it was present in the early universe and it's still around today. Um, we know it's, you know, pretty boring in terms of the dynamics of what it's doing. Um, although there's places where it could do inter interesting stuff that I'll mention briefly. Um, but most of all, we know it cannot be accounted for by, by known physics. And so what I mean by known physics uh, is that we have this beautiful picture of the standard model of particle physics that uh, we've been building up over many decades. Um, so here's how I like to think about the standard model, um, kind of as a Venn diagram of what are the fundamental particles that we know about and what forces do, th do those different particles feel? We have the strong force, uh, you know, it's a nuclear force. Uh, we have electromagnetism, the weak force. And then the outermost circle of this Venn diagram is actually gravity. Uh, gravity, we think, is universal in that it couples uh, to anything that has mass or energy. Uh, and that, am that amazing fact uh, is why we've been able to infer the existence of some new particle that we know is not part of the standard model. Okay. So given all of this stuff happening over here with the standard model, it's possible that this new particle comes along with its own bubble of the Venn diagram. I think that's a highly conceivable possibility. And if that's the case, maybe that bubble overlaps and there's some you know, non-gravitational interaction with the standard model that we can use to test theories of dark matter in an experiment. Uh, or maybe that's not the case. Maybe we, we just have to use gravity. So there's a wide range of possibilities there. If we focus on a different property of dark matter, namely its mass, there's also a huge range of possibilities. So the constraints on the mass of whatever is making up the dark matter, whether it's a particle or something else, uh, those uh, possibilities span over 90 orders of magnitude in mass. It's a huge, huge, you know, unfathomably large range. Um, so of course, you know, there's a huge diversity here across these 90 orders of magnitude, and I've tried to schematically shade them here. Now, um, because of this really broad diversity, we're not gonna be able to have a one size fits all approach to testing all these theories of dark matter. And so in my group, you know, if we think about on the X axis, the range of uh, dark matter masses and on the Y axis, the scales of our universe where we can test these different theories, my group really tries to populate uh, this entire space to the fullest extent that we can. So um, past publications from my group, uh, each of these bubbles corresponds to one or more publications from my group. Um, and in the course of studying this question, uh, we're really doing a variety of different kinds of things from creating new models of dark matter, testing uh, or, or coming up with, you know, uh, ways in which those models would be manifest in our universe and, and would have effects on what we can see, thinking of new probes. And even at times, even though we're theorists, sometimes we do roll up our sleeves and get into the data. Um, so we're able to actually do full cycles of the scientific method from making a hypothesis and then testing that hypothesis. So that's, I think, very fun. Um, just to give a couple of super lightning fast examples to be concrete of different kinds of dark matter things we've been thinking about in, in recent years is, you know, what if dark matter could dissipate energy and cool down? Could that affect the structure of galaxies? Or what if dark matter is um, scattering in an inelastic way? You can release energy or absorb energy. Uh, can that basically dissolve the smallest structures that we see? Uh, what if dark matter is uh, quantum in nature? What if it has a de Broglie wavelength that, that, that can erase structure and how would that affect gravitational lensing? Uh, and finally, how can we make dark matter in the primordial plasma of the early universe? And does the mechanism for making dark matter affect the later evolution of the universe? So I'll just uh, leave my summary slide here. Um, it's a huge space of possibilities, but also a huge universe. And so we have a lot of room for creativity of coming up with different ways to test theories. So thanks very much. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions in the breakout room. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for that uh, great talk, Caitlin. I'm really captivated by the fact that you study this material and you can't explain it by the known laws of physics. And just to generalize a bit, I mean, for me as a researcher, those things that don't fit are always where the most interesting new ideas 
come from and new discoveries. So it's really super interesting. And um, I also think that the constellation, so to speak, of the last three talks really highlights what uh, Principal Fortier mentioned at the beginning of the session, which is how much we is still uh, still remains to be known and how many discoveries are still out there. Uh, so now let's come back to Earth. And our final speaker before the breakout room uh, is Joe Sanchez from the Department of Biology. Uh, Joe is a student in, this is my home department, biology. Uh, Joe is a student in our department and uh, he's gonna give you an, an, an idea. We've talking, talked a lot about student participation in research in our faculty and here's a great example of that. Go ahead, Joe. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Joe and I'm very glad to be here. I'm finishing up my undergraduate degree in uh, biology with a focus kind of on environmental science this spring. And for the past eight months, I've had the opportunity to conduct some quantitative research that examines land use impact on lake water quality for the Lake Pulse Project with our very own Professor Gregory Eaves and some partners from Université Sherbrooke and uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now, Canada has more than 1 million lakes and a very large proportion of the world's fresh water. But the truth is, is there's a massive data gap in terms of our lakes. We have very little baseline data with which to gauge the impacts of land use change, climate change, uh, and several contaminants on our freshwater ecosystems. Now, this project aims to bring together researchers, environmental activists, and policymakers to try to uphold the responsibility we feel we have towards lake stewardship here in Canada. Um, it really, uh, the, the goal is to integrate uh, a nationwide lake survey, which you can see here on screen, all the, all the lakes that were surveyed, um, a historical lake and watershed data, um, and also integrating modern federal and provincial geospatial data sets into our research that will hopefully uh, inform environmental policy in the near future. And so my participation in the project began after uh, the spatial, biochemical, and optical information from the lake survey had already been uh, thankfully compiled into very accessible data sets, which you can see kind of an example on the right. Uh, and on the left, you can actually see a map of how the geomatic data, the land use data, was structured kind of in rings around the lakes. Um, and the, the specific structure of the land use data, the ring structure, allowed me to examine if land use uh, near the shore affected lake water quality more than land use farther away, because it might seem obvious, but it's actually not, and there's not a lot of research in terms of uh, Canadian lakes, especially the smaller ones. Now, I didn't I haven't gotten any conclusive results on this topic yet, but uh, the project has kind of evolved into a study about how land use affects lake water quality across different Canadian ecozones, which is to say regions with similar biotic and abiotic characteristics, such as, for example, climate or a species composition. Now, I really learned so much, you know, regarding coding, statistics, the, the scientific method, concise speaking and writing, and so much that I've ever learned. Um, you know, in school, I think, because I was actively applying these skills throughout the development of the project and its success basically hinged on me investing into these skills. And it was very motivating. Um, now, what I did basically is I used several statistical techniques. I learned a lot in terms of multi multivariate uh, analysis to try to analyze the correlations between different land use proportions, such as agriculture, urbanization, mining, and lake chemistry parameters, such as uh, ions, uh, nutrients, and for example, chlorophyll measurements. Now, our results currently indicate that lakes in the prairies and the boreal plains, which you can see in yellow and orange, uh, located around southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, have significantly higher amounts of ions, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and chlorophyll A than their counterparts elsewhere. They are different. Um, and uh, uh, further investigations showed that uh, it was mainly agriculture um, that um, had a significantly large effect on lake water quality, uh, agriculture proportion in the watershed, that is. And we hypothesized that this might be due to increased nutrient export to lakes, uh, maybe given their flatter topography, uh, maybe just given due to their naturally higher nutrient baselines in the prairies, or maybe simply the fact that these regions are just naturally much more amenable to agriculture or just a combination of all those facts. So, so we're, that's what we're kind of looking at right now. And we hope to get this information into the hands of people who can make a difference soon. Thank you.